Welcome. Thank you for joining us for Story Hour in the Library. We'd like to let you know about our next reading, which is on November 10th with Francis Dinkelspiel. So we hope you'll join us at five o'clock back here in the Morrison. At this time, if you'd like to sign up to find out more about our Story Hour, we do have a flyer up at the front that you're more than welcome to do. We also have a website, storyhour.berkeley.edu, where you can see our full season lineup, and you can follow us on Facebook at Story Hour in the Library at UC Berkeley. Uh, we ask you to silence your cell phones and you have to get up and leave anytime. Just please do so quietly. And we'd like to thank our author this uh, month, Karen, for joining us. And I'd like to invite Vikram up to do our introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Karen Joy Foyle Fowler to Story Hour today. Karen was born in Indiana, where her father was a professor of psychology at Bloomington. Her family moved to Palo Alto when she was 11, and she subsequently came to Cal as an undergraduate and majored in political science. She gave birth to her first child during the last year of a master's program at UC Davis, and then entered what she calls her child-rearing years. At the age of 30, she took her first creative writing class at UC Davis. Since then, she has published three collections of short stories and six novels, all highly regarded and well-reviewed. Her early work was in science fiction. Uh, she's won both the World Fantasy Award and the Nebula Award. Her literary fiction has been equally celebrated. The novel, The Jane Austen Club, was a New York Times notable book. In Booklist, Donna Seaman wrote, Fowler shares Austen's fascination with the power of stories and explores the same timeless aspects of human behavior that Austen so masterfully dramatizes while capturing with anthropological acuity and electrifying humor the oddities of our harried world. My first encounter with Karen's work was her novel, We Are All Completely Besides Ourselves, which I read in one long enthralled session on a flight to Australia. I don't know how much to tell you about it. In her review in the New York Times, Barbara Kingsolver begins the review with, to experience this novel exactly as the author intended, a reader should, should avoid the flap copy and everything else written about it, including this review. Uh, I had, knew nothing about the book. A friend of mine just emailed me and said, you have to read this, and I downloaded it on my tablet uh, and read it, so I didn't have any flap copy giving away spoilers. So, um, and I derive so much pleasure from the reveal that I'm reluctant to give away too much information. In spite of the fact that Karen, uh, I've read her in an interview saying that she doesn't worry about keeping the secret during readings. Um, anyway, in her review, King Solver goes on to describe the book as a novel so, juicy, so readably juicy and surreptitiously smart, it deserves all the attention it can get. And I agree. Uh, the book was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and won the Penn Faulkner Award. Karen and her husband live in Santa Cruz. Karen created the James Tiptree Jr. Memorial Award, which is presented annually to a science fiction or fantasy story or novel, which explores and expands our understanding of gender. She is the current president of the Clarion Foundation, which provides support for the science fiction and fantasy writers workshop at UCSD. Please join me in welcoming Karen Joy Fowler. Thank you very much, Vikram, and thank you all for being here. I have to say, I'm not, um, I'm not used to looking out at an audience who are seated in such comfortable chairs. Uh, I, I worry, I worry about you staying awake in those uh, very plush thrones that you're on. I know that I would have trouble. So I will do my best to be enthralling, but if I am not, uh, feel free to nod off. Um, uh, my plan is to read a little bit and then talk about the novel for a little bit and then depending on the time to maybe read a little bit more and talk a little bit more uh, and then to take questions. And so I will, I will let you know up front that the Q&A section of events is always my favorite. Um, I know what I'm going to say, so there is really no chance for delight and surprise. <laughs> for me in my part, um, and all, uh, my only hope for delight and surprise comes from you and your questions. So please do have questions. Be aware that I am perfectly capable of standing here with a shaming look on my face for as long as it takes <laughs> until somebody's hand goes up. Um, 
best, best to be prepared. I'm going to start, I'm going to read the prologue, and I'm going to read the first page of the first chapter, and then talk to you a little bit about it. So uh, I am reading, I should have said, from um, We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, which uh, tragically, because it, because it is no longer really a recent novel, remains my most recent novel. Those who know me now will be surprised to learn I was a great talker as a child. We have a home movie taken when I was two years old, the old-fashioned kind with no soundtrack, and by now the colors have bled out, a white sky, my red sneakers, a ghostly pink, but you can still see how much I used to talk. I'm doing a bit of landscaping, picking up one stone at a time from our gravel driveway, carrying it to a large tin wash tub, dropping it in, and going back for the next. I'm working hard, but showily. I widen my eyes like a silent film star. I hold up a clear piece of quartz to be admired, put it in my mouth, stuff it into one cheek. My mother appears and removes it. She steps back then out of the frame, but I'm speaking emphatically now. You can see this in my gestures, and she returns drops the stone into the tub. The whole thing lasts about five minutes, and I never stop talking. A few years later, Mom read us that old fairy tale in which one sister, the older, speaks in toads and snakes, and the other, the younger, in flowers and jewels. And this is the image it conjured for me, this scene from this movie, where my mother puts her hand into my mouth and pulls out a diamond. I was toe-headed back then, prettier as a child than I've turned out, and dolled up for the camera. My flyaway bangs are pasted down with water and held on one side by a rhinestone barrette shaped like a bow. Whenever I turn my head, the barrette blinks in the sunlight. My little hand sweeps over my tub of rocks. All this I could be saying. All this will be yours someday. Or something else entirely. The point of the movie isn't the words themselves. What my parents valued was their extravagant abundance, their inexhaustible flow. Still, there were occasions on which I had to be stopped. When you think of two things to say, pick your favorite and only say that, my mother suggested once as a tip to polite social behavior, and the rule was later modified to one in three. <laughs> my father would come to my bedroom door each night to wish me happy dreams, and I would speak without taking a breath, trying desperately to keep him in my room with only my voice. I would see his hand on the doorknob, the door beginning to swing shut. I have something to say, I'd tell him, and the door would stop midway. Start in the middle then, he'd answer, a shadow with the hall light behind him and tired in the evenings the way grown-ups are. The light would reflect in my bedroom window like a star you could wish on. Skip the beginning, start in the middle. So this is uh, page one of chapter one. So the middle of my story comes in the winter of 1996. By then, we'd long since dwindled to the family that old home movie foreshadowed, me, my mother, and unseen but evident behind the camera, my father. In 1996, 10 years had passed since I'd last seen my brother. 17 since my sister disappeared. The middle of my story is all about their absence, although if I hadn't told you that, you might not have known. By 1996, whole days went by in which I hardly thought of either one. 1996, leap year, year of the fire rat. President Clinton had just been reelected. This would all end in tears. Kabul had fallen to the Taliban. The siege of Sarajevo had ended. Charles had recently divorced Diana. Hailbop came swinging into our sky. Claims of a Saturn-like object in the comet's wake first surfaced that November. Dolly the clone sheep and Deep Blue the chess plane computer program were superstars. There was evidence of life on Mars. The Saturn-like object in Hailbop's tail was maybe an alien spaceship. In May of, nine, of 97, 39 people would kill themselves as a prerequisite to climbing aboard. 
Against this backdrop, how ordinary I look. Vikram was telling me that he's, he's working on some sort of program that will keep your dates clear as you're writing longer works. And, um, and with that in mind, um, and having only recently been corrected on this, I will mention that it was apparently not May of 97, it was March of 97, so already I have lied to you in my book. Um, um, so um, when I, I actually got the idea for this book at a very specific moment and in a very specific way. And that has been true of only two of my books. M most of my books, um, I, I come up with a story and I, I create the, the characters and the events that are gonna move the story forward a little bit at a time. I sort of, it, it's a process of accumulation. I think, well, maybe I can use this and maybe I can use that. And eventually I feel I have enough that I can perhaps get 300 plus pages out of it. Um, but um, coincidentally or not coincidentally, the two books that have been by far my most successful, the Jane Austen Book Club and We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, came, the idea really came as a lightning strike all at once. So in the Jane Austen Book Club, it happened this way. I was at the Book Passage, the fabulous bookstore in um, Corte Madero, and I had gone to see my friend Carter Schultz, who was reading from his uh, then new novel, Brilliance, or Radiance, sorry. Um, Carter is brilliant. The novel is Radiance. Um, and, um, and I was just, I was killing time until Carter arrived and started, and there was a sign on the, on the wall that said the Jane Austen Book Club. And because I was in a bookstore, I thought this was the title of a book that somebody was selling, somebody had written and was now selling a book called the Jane Austen Book book club. Um, and I, you know, my first reaction was an incredible mix of um, excitement because I was going to get to read a book that I thought would probably please me very much and disappointment because I thought I could have written that book if I'd only had the idea and why do I never get good ideas like other people get. Um, Eventually, as I looked more closely at the sign, I saw that there were dates and times, and I realized that it was, in fact, a book club and not a book. I had actually um, already started We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, and I put it down to write the Jane Austen Book Club because I thought writers are in and out of that store all the time. They're walking <laughs> by that sign. You know, there's a very limited time I have in which to write this book before anybody else does. Um, as a sort of wonderful finish to the story, uh, a couple of years after it came out, I got to be the guest of honor at the um, North American Jane Austen Society's General Assembly. And I told that story, and there was a woman in the audience who raised her hand and said, I just want you to know I'm the person who put that sign in that bookstore. <laughs> So I, I asked her to please see me after. I said, you know, I think I probably owe you a drink. And I was thinking in my heart, I probably owe you a car, actually. <laughs> um, so that was the Jane Austen Book Club. For we are all completely beside ourselves. Um, it happened this way. I, I grew up in Bloomington, Indiana. I lived there till I was 11 years old. And then my father got a job in Palo Alto. Both of my parents were native Californians, so they looked at our time in Indiana as a dreadful exile, which could not end too soon. But I, who had lived at that point all my life in Bloomington, was very unhappy about the idea that we would move. Um, for years, I have told people that at age 11, I was moved from the utopia of Bloomington, Indiana, to the hellhole of Palo Alto, California. <laughs> Um, I have lived in California, sort of circling San Francisco ever since, and um, so I have a husband who is a native Californian, and I have two children who are native Californians, um, and yet I am not the sort who suffers in silence, so at every possible opportunity, uh, all through my marriage and all through my children's uh, growing up, 
I rarely missed a chance to point out that happy as we were, we would be ever so much happier if we only lived in Bloomington, Indiana. And eventually, um, my daughter said to me, you realize if I do ever get to Bloomington, and it's not like that moment in The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy steps into the full Technicolor, I'm gonna think you oversold it. But um, for the 2000, the, the millennial new year, um, she and uh, her then boyfriend said that they were gonna take me on a trip and that I should meet them at the airport and I should dress for cold weather and that was all they were gonna tell me. My husband did not get to come along. Um, you may or may not remember that, um, that the world was ending at 12.01 on the millennial new year. My, uh, my husband works, worked for the Sacramento Municipal Utility District and so he had to be at his post ushering in the Mad Max future that was about to descend on us all. So while he was doing that, protecting all of you from the chaos that was about to ensue, uh, my daughter and her boyfriend and I were flying off to Indiana where we had a complete Hoosier New Year. Um, we went to a Pacers game, we went to a John Mellencamp concert, we danced until dawn at the Slippery Noodle Blues Club in Indianapolis, and then her boyfriend went home and she and I went on down to Bloomington. So we were walking around the IU campus and I was talking to her about her grandfather. He, uh, he died before she was born, so he's much as Bloomington was a mythical place to her, my father was a mythical figure to her. He worked uh, in the psychology department and he studied learning. And he studied learning by running rats through mazes. So much of my childhood, many, many happy hours of my childhood were spent in the rat lab um, where my dad worked. Um, at the time, it seemed to me to be a pretty happy place, that the rats looked healthy, they were all very curious, I was allowed to uh, open any cage, remove a rat, talk to it for as long as I wished, no doubt wreaking havoc with the data, and then put it back. Um, and um, there was only one part of the lab that I was not allowed to go into, and that was where the rhesus monkeys were. There were two rhesus monkeys. They were in side-by-side -side cages, but not so close that they could touch each other. And, um, you know, no matter how little I may have been when I first encountered them, and I'm guessing maybe five, um, there was no missing how tormented these monkeys had been. They had pulled their hair out. They, um, they, they were in terrible shape. I was not allowed to go anywhere near them because they would, if they could, reach through the bars and grab you and bite you. Um, they, were, they were mad in every sense of the word. They were, they were furious and they were completely insane and they were completely miserable. So um, I think that I have spent my whole life haunted by those two monkeys. And when I was taking my daughter around my father's lab, I talked about them to her and I moved from that to an experiment that took place in the 1930s, which is um, what my book is really based on. Um, there are things about my childhood, perhaps there are things about your childhood that um, it takes you a moment to notice are not necessarily the same things that other people had in their childhoods. I, for example, sometimes catch myself about to talk about the nostalgic hit we all get off the smell of rat cages, only to realize that that is in fact just me and that you do not get a nostalgic hit off the smell of rat cages. Um, this experiment was in my mind such a famous one that everybody n knew about it. I had certainly heard about it my whole life. Uh, and it was not until I was telling my own daughter about it that I realized that I had never told her about it before, that nobody else had ever told her about it, that it was not an experiment she had ever heard of. And it was an experiment that shocked her to the core. And she said, um, 
because the experiment involved a child, what would it be like to be that child? She said, that's the next book you should write, Mom. Um, as the story with the Jane Austen Book Club has already demonstrated, I do not have good ideas myself, but I do know them when I see or hear them. And the minute she said that, I thought, yes, that, I, that would be a great idea for a book. I will write that book. We now come to the awkward moment where um, I should tell you what the experiment was. Uh, and, and yet, I, I do have to pause for a moment before I do so, because I, if you've read the book, I think it is abundantly clear that I do not intend you to know what the book is about until you hit about page 77 or so. That, that I have, um, the actual subject matter of the book ha I have kept hidden from you for all of those pages and that I wish it to be a surprise. Um, and and I, I, you know, I, I, I would never, um, revisit that decision. I think that's always the way I pictured the book. Uh, as, as was clear in the pages I read, the story starts in the middle so that I can keep that surprise for you. That's, that's the whole reason for starting in the middle. Um, and yet, I, you know, I never really thought through the implications of, of what it would be like for my marketing department to try to sell a book in which they could not tell you what the book was about, um, which they immediately complained to me about, um, what it would be like for reviewers to try to review a book but not tell you what it was about, um, both problems that I had a modest amount of sympathy for, but um, it truly did not cross my mind uh, that this would fall on me as well, that I would be facing uh, eventually an audience that I very much hoped would wish to read my book um, and yet feel that I could not tell you what my book was about. So, um, so I am gonna tell you what my book is about, but I am, I am trusting you to um, wipe it from your mind the minute you leave this room, that um, if you've not read the book before, I feel it is not asking too much of you to forget everything that I am now about to say. The experiment which took place in the 1930s um, involved a family uh, called the Kelloggs. The father was Winthrop Kellogg. He was a psychologist also at uh, Indiana University, but not at the same time my dad was. They did not overlap. Um, and the experiment that he did did not take place in Indiana. The experiment that he did was um, that he brought a, an infant chimpanzee into the house at, at the same time that he and his wife had an infant son. And his plan was that they would um, they would raise the two in as similar a way as seemed reasonable, and um, in you know in a sort of compare and contrast experiment to see what the child was capable of that the chimpanzee was not capable of, what the chimpanzee was capable of that the child was not capable of. Um, the experiment was supposed to last five years. In my fictionalized account of the experiment, which takes place in the 70s, um, for other reasons. I did make it last the five years that it was originally supposed to last. The actual experiment did not last that long. The actual experiment lasted, I think, somewhere between 16 to 18 months. And, um, and it ended because, uh, in a way that apparently nobody anticipated, um, the child in the experiment picked up chimp behaviors just as quickly as the chimp picked up human behaviors. And the rumor is that one morning when little Donald Kellogg uh, greeted his breakfast cereal with the delighted food hoot of the hungry chimpanzee that his mother turned to her husband and said, right, that's the end. That's the end of this experiment. Um, as I said, in my own book, it, it, the experiment goes on for about five years. Uh, which is, I think, in all honesty, probably the least plausible part of the book. 
everything else I stand by. Um, uh, but that, that I needed because I needed uh, a narrator who remembered something. And it seemed to me things that happened to her when she was five year, years old was about the outer edge of what I could suggest she might remember, have some memories of. My father, as I told you, um, studied learning, and he studied learning uh, behaviors in rats in particular. Uh, and um, I think that I was possibly six years old when we started having an argument that went on the rest of his life um, over whether animals could think or not. And a, a, in my mind, a lot of what is happening in this book is that I am still arguing with my father over whether animals can think or not. I had a, a, um, an, an interesting sort of journey of my own when I wrote the book, um, that when I started, I was very, very focused on the Kellogg experiment. And I was focused as well on the other experiments, of which there were a surprising number, in which people tried to home raise chimpanzees as if they were human children. As far as I know, the Kellogg experiment is the only one which involved an actual human child. But many of the others, um, many of the other experiments did take place with children in the house. The children were just older when the chimp came in, so, um, so they were not as thoroughly imprinted as they would have been had they been infants like Donald Kellogg. Um, and I was, um, I was very distressed by these experiments. I read, uh, as part of writing the book, I read a number of accounts, of non-fictional accounts, of people who were involved in these experiments. And uh, again, there are a surprising number of these books. Um, recounting what it was like to live with a chimpanzee and, and what happened to the, during the experiments uh, as they took place. Um, what I could find nothing about was the children, if there were children in the house. They were, they were not part of these books. They were rarely mentioned in these books. And, um, and so, you know, in order to focus on the character, which is, in fact, the character my daughter suggested to me, the child, uh, I had to make a lot of things up. But, um, I, uh, as I said, I was, I was distressed by these experiments, and I was particularly distressed because they seemed designed to create a creature for whom there would be no place in the world. They seemed, um, you know, they seemed designed for an unhappy ending. And one of the most moving images that I came across over and over again in these books was uh, the idea that, um, that the chimpanzee would be given um, photographs of chimp faces and of human faces and asked to sort them into the two piles, something that they could easily and readily do, with one exception, that they always put their own photograph in the human pile um, and not in the chimp pile. So at the end of these experiments, what you had was a chimp who did not know how to be a chimp and a chimp who was unable to be human. And, and I thought because the line between us is in fact so thin that this, this was a terrible, terrible thing to visit on, on a creature that was so human-like. And then um, I was maybe halfway through the book when I suddenly thought, wait a second. Um, is what I am arguing that the more human-like another animal is, the more respect and care they deserve. Because that's not the argument I want to make. That's not something I believe. Uh, you know, wh what's being like, uh, what's so special about being like us? And at that point, I thought, um, that I just needed to know a lot more about animal cognition in general. And I moved past the very focused research I was doing on, on the chimps in these experiments. Uh, I went um, up the hill in Santa Cruz to the university, and I persuaded a professor who was teaching an animal theory class to let me sit in on it and, um, and just learned amazing 
uh, amazing things. We, we looked at rats, we looked at crows, we looked at octopus, we looked at elephants, we looked at tigers, we looked at horses, we looked at dogs, we looked at honeybees, we looked at uh, crows. Um, in every case, I think there was one simple take home message for me, and it was that at every possible point, um, we have underestimated the capabilities and the complexity of the creatures that we share the planet with. So um, writing the book for me was an exhilarating and illuminating learning experience uh, from which I have not recovered. I, I became a vegetarian while I was writing this book. Uh, and, uh, I, and I feel in, in a... Uh, moment of triumph. I should be too mature at 66 to share with you that um, that I was so right when I was six, and my dad was so wrong. Uh, unfortunately, he's not alive to see uh, his utter defeat at the hands of his six-year-old daughter. Um, but I know my dad, and I think he would have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to tell you one story, um, and then I'm, I am running out of time, so I will throw it open to questions, but one story that will just stand in for the many, many things I learned in this class, uh, all of which I hope I brought in some way to the book, um, which is about crows. Uh, and this is, this is kind of a famous story, so forgive me if you've already heard it, but um, there's a long-running research project uh, at UW up in Seattle, where cr campus crows are captured and they're brought back to a lab and blood samples are taken and they're, they're banded and um, information is collected about the campus crows. They are then re-released re into the campus. But it turns out that crows have quite incredible facial recognition skills. There was uh, one of the things I read when I was researching the book is that there was a a, a, a proposal at one point that crows um, be used to find Osama bin Laden. In any case, um, on the Seattle campus, what began to happen is that the graduate students who were involved in the capture of these crows uh, were recognized as they walked through campus by the crows. And things were dropped on their heads, and um, r rude, rude comments were shouted at them wherever they went. Uh, and they graduated, and they left the campus, and they came back for a reunion five years later, and the crows remembered exactly who they were. And ten years later, a whole new generation of crows had been told about these horrible people and recognized them the instant they set foot on campus. As a result, the research now continues, but the graduate students who do it wear enormous uh, clown wigs and, and clown faces, um, which, uh, once again, I feel, is not really consulting the needs of the crows, because if there is anything more terrifying than being <laughs> snatched by a clown, <laughs> I cannot imagine what it might be. Um, one final little statement um, that, uh, uh, that I read a lot of, of primatology also when I was writing this book. And, um, and so, you know, if, as I proposed earlier, chimpanzees are very, very like us, it follows that we are very, very like them, and that there are a number of ways in which we can see this very clearly. Um, I think, you know, if you look at the present presidential campaign, you will see a lot of display behavior and a lot of chest beating and a lot of dominance politics um, in a way that really does not become us very well. Um, but also it is apparently a, 
it, it is natural for primates to feel empathy. That, that's sort of the good news, that empathy is a very natural, c comes to us as part of our Darwinian heritage, that, that we are an empathetic species. Many species are empathetic, but all of the great apes are. The bad news is that we extend this empathy only to those we see as like ourselves. And as soon as we, as primates, can put another creature into the category of the other, not only does our empathy um, vanish, but we have an actual antipathy. We have what the great primatologist Franz Duwall calls an empathy deficit. And so, you know, in the course of writing this book, in the course of thinking about this book, in the course of doing the research for the book, I have come to believe very strongly that it is the project of literature to extend our circle of empathy, to, to bring into our circle of empathy uh, creatures that we, um, that we might otherwise have thought of as not like us. Um, and that is what I tried to do in my book. To the, I tried to stretch the circle of empathy to the farthest possible point I could, uh, I could make it until um, pill bugs are given, a, a, I feel, a very sympathetic treatment um, and, uh, and, and until, um, until, as the book says, we see that we are all completely beside ourselves everywhere we go. I will stop there and take those questions. I know you've been preparing the whole time I've been talking. Yes? My memory doesn't always go far back to the beginning of what you said. I'm going to touch the end a little bit and also comment on something. Um, one of my dear and closest friends is someone who does research on primates at UC Davis. And he's a person who is also vegan and vegetarian, and he's a veterinarian by training. Um, someone who dearly loved animals, cared for them from the time he was a child, who, when he was accepted for a PhD program there, said, yes, but I don't want to do any uh, research that would involve research on primates, you know, especially, and then ended up doing studies related to AIDS and HIV and to helping develop the drug that is actually used in the cocktail of drugs that has, you know, saved many, many people. So having said that, um, and I know my own thoughts have evolved on animal research and on many things. Um, what you said about empathy, you know, how, how do you negotiate that? You became a vegetarian, but how, how do you continue to negotiate that? You know, nothing about this is simple, I think. Or, no, I won't say that. Some things in it are simple. I think, you know, that we, I, I would expect to get very little disagreement if I said um, torturing animals for the purpose of making cosmetics is unconscionable. I, I don't think anybody would have a problem with that. It's when you get to medical research that the issue becomes quite complicated. Um, I, um, you know, I, I'm a novelist. I don't solve problems. I merely point them out. Uh, so um, I would say that, you know, that there are a number of things about it that that concern me or that I think about, um, uh, one of which is that I think it's a very cruel thing for the researcher to, to do these things. I think it must, it must be very hard. You must have to harden yourself in a way that I think would be very painful. Um, I also, um, I also, you know, the, the, the scientific method is, uh, has a lot of redundancy built in that, you know, the tests have to be done on numerous subjects, um, numerous times, um, and that thought is painful to me as well. I, I would hope that, you know, that some consideration is given to trying to limit, um, limit it to just what you might need. 
um, it, it, you know, I can't, I, I can't take a kind of clean approach to it because I'm fully aware that if it were my child, I would, you know, I would want the medical research done. I have been blessed that it has not been my child, but it's always somebody's child. And um, so, yes, I think all of that is very difficult. I, I would love to think that we are maybe headed towards a place where computer modeling can, uh, can replace, uh, surely not all, but much of the kinds of studies that are being done. And that care be taken to, um, if the animals are being subjected to these sorts of things, that their lives be made as pleasant as possible in whatever ways they can be. Um, and that's where I am at the moment. Um, I do think that, uh, that another thing I'll say just about, about my particular morality, that, that if I have a really sort of steadfast moral precept, it would be that, um, that we ought to look at what we're doing. And that's, that's what I would like my book to do. I'm, I'm not trying to tell anybody how to feel or how to believe, but I'm just trying to say these things are going on and we should look at them. You know, when I was on this campus, um, the Vietnam War was, uh, was happening. And one of the things that was a sort of daily part of our lives was a, was a body count, that if you turned on the television news, you would get some sort of estimate about how many people had died in Vietnam today and, you know, divided, of course, into the two camps. And because um, many people in power believe that we lost the war in Vietnam because the people lost the, you know, lost the toughness they needed to see it through to the end, um, the main thing that they learned was not to show people the body counts anymore. You know, there was absolutely no effort to keep track of the, uh, of the Iraqis who died in, during that invasion. And, um, and it became illegal to photograph the American bodies coming home. And so, the, you know, this is, this is the way we proceed in so many areas in our lives. We, the, our, our prisons have been removed from our site so that we do not have to see what goes on in them. Um, our, um, our, the factory farms, in several states, it's now either illegal or being proposed uh, as illegal to take any picture that shows people what happens to animals on the factory farms. So that I do find offensive. I think, uh, you know, if we're going to do something, we ought to look at it. And if we can't bear to look at it, then we shouldn't do it. Thank you. I listened to an interview with Ann Patchett recently in which she talked about uh, research versus writing. She said that, you know, if she's, she said she never does the research until she's written the book. And then she goes back and corrects herself. She said, if she, if she wants to write about an evolutionary biologist and she reads a book about evolutionary biology, she realizes she doesn't know anything about it and then the impulse is to read more and more and more. She said research is fun and writing is hard and so she does the writing first. So I wonder if you obviously have to do a lot of research for your books. What's your principle on that? Well, first of all, I would not argue with Ann Patchett for anything in the world. Um, I, I certainly would want only that Ann Patchett continues to write the books that Ann Patchett writes. But um, I, when I write a book, uh, rarely know much about what the story will be or where the, where the story will go. You know, I, I've got something. I've got, I'm, uh, I'm going to write a book that takes place in San Francisco in the 1890s, for example. Um, but I don't know who the book will be about at that point. I don't know um, what the story will be. And so I, a lot of what I do when I'm doing the research is look for the story. I, I, the, the reading I do um, is, you know, d does impact the book. I, I, 
if I tried to write the book before I did the research, I would have no story at all. So um, I can't proceed that way. But I think that Ann Patchett has a better sense of what her story is going to be. And then she can do very targeted research uh, for what she needs. But, um, but that, you know, she is quite right that research is far more pleasurable than writing. And, you know, in, in my utopian world, um, I would just do the research and never write the book, which is where I seem to be at this moment with my next book. Um, so I think she's very smart, but I could not possibly, I could not possibly do that. Bikram. Well, that's tricky, too. You know, this is something um, that does not answer your question at all, and yet um, strikes me as strange and interesting, that, um, that when I'm, you know, when I'm doing the research, I'm mostly, uh, I'm looking at books uh, a lot. I'm on the web now, too, but uh, still looking at books a lot, and I'm taking notes. Um, but often, I don't take the note I need. Uh, you know, I will remember that I read something, and I now need to see what that was, and I did not write it down. Um, and what I remember is what part of the page it was on. I remember, you know, well, it was in the upper co left-hand corner of the page. Um, so, uh, you know, I have to flip through books looking at the left-hand corner of every page. Um, and, um, and the interesting part, I think, is that, that, uh, that I, I, don't, I can't do that on the Kindle. I don't have that same geographical sense of the book that I'm reading in a way that, that actually impacts the reading experience, whether I'm doing research or, or just reading a book for pleasure, that there's something, um, there's, there's something very different for me. Uh, a lot of it just has to do with that very physical, tangible sense of how many pages remain at any given moment, which I don't experience in the same physical way with a Kindle. So that did not answer your question at all. But I, you know, I have um, I have notebooks and I have files and I uh, have um, much unorganized material, and then in general discover that the thing that I actually need is not in those files and those notebooks, and I have to return to the book and search for it. And very, very frustratingly, sometimes never find it again at all. Yes? Yes, um, tremendously so. I think, you know, th there are a couple of things I would say about that. First of all, when I started my first novel, um, I think that there are people who come to writing because they have a story they really want to tell. Um, and that was not me. I just, I wanted to be a writer. And so I go looking for stories to tell. Uh, and the fir my first novel, it's a book called Sarah Canary, and the um, main character in it is, uh, takes place in 1873 on the western coast of the US, and the main character is a Chinese railway worker. And the only reason I imagined I could possibly get away with that was that I had written my master's thesis on the Chinese diaspora, um, and particularly on the west coast. So I. There were things I knew about that historical period and about that community. Um, my undergraduate degree, which was here, 
um, was in South Asian politics, and uh, I was particularly interested in um, the independence movement and Gandhi. And so that was my second novel. Um, I, I drew on some of that to create a story um, that actually takes place in the Midwest and has nothing to do with Gandhi except that there's a woman in it who's following the independence movement very closely and is, um, uh, is, is bringing the techniques of Gandhian um, political struggle to this Midwestern town uh, to organize things more as she would like them to be organized. So in many ways, I feel, you know, every time I write a book, I go a little deeper into my past. So I started with my graduate degree. Then I went to my undergraduate degree. Um, you know, finally, with, with We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, I've ended up in my childhood, which is maybe why I have no idea where to go next or what to do next. But, um, but yes, um, what I love about science fiction um, is, is the big picture of it, the, the world it takes place in. And so um, I think that, that having that, those degrees uh, and having taken those classes, what, what I like to do is to tell a fairly small story, but I like it to be clearly embedded in a very large world in which many, many other things are going on, some of which impact my story, most of which do not. Um, but I, I never want to lose sight of the fact that uh, although my story is happening, many, many other things are happening as well. And so science fiction seems like a comfortable fit for that sort of thinking. Yes? Um, it seems to me that choosing to start in the middle, in addition to what you said about having challenges in terms of reviewing the book and describing the book, also has challenges in terms of the structure of the book. Um, and I just wondered if you could speak about how what challenges you faced and, and how you dealt with them? Yeah, I don't. Um, I, I didn't experience them as challenges. Again, I've I've written I've written six novels now, and three of them, I just sort of started on page one and uh, you know tried to feel slowly my way forward, tapping across the ice, um, trying to get to the to the end on the other side. And three of them, uh, I, I already told you that I don't really know what the story is, um, but for three of them, I had a structure in mind in spite of that. And that's a far more pleasurable experience for me. It breaks the whole process of writing a novel down into chunks that I feel I can manage better. So, um, for example, the Jane Austen Book Club, I told you that I got the idea at the Book Passage um, bookstore. Um, I saw the sign. I thought, yes, I will write that book. I listened to my friend Carter Schultz uh, do his reading. I drove home to Davis, from, from Corte Madero to Davis, because I was living in Davis then. Um, and when the front wheels of my car started onto the Richmond Bridge, I knew that I was going to write a book called The Jane Austen Book Club. And by the time my back wheels left the Richmond Bridge, I had the whole structure in my head. I knew there would be six people in the club. I knew they would, all, they would look at the six most famous novels of Jane Austen. I knew that it would take place over six months each month being uh, you know, a book club meeting at another person's house and looking at another novel. Um, and so then, you know, then all I have to do is March, April. Um, and so I, that was a similar experience um, with this book that I, I did not know. I knew that I had to start in the middle. Having decided that and, and re recognizing now that I'm just much happier if I've got some sort of scaffolding I thought, well, okay, well, I'll do the middle, and then I'll do the beginning of the middle, and then I'll do the end of the middle, and then I'll do the end of the beginning, and then I'll do the beginning of the end, and then I'll do the beginning, and then I'll do the end. And so, um, nothing could be easier. <laughs> well, 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.